Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, where we serve a still speaking God. If you are young or old, you are welcome. If you are kissed by the sun or challenged by it, you are welcome. If you are gay, straight, bisexual, transgender, or questioning, guess what? You are welcome. In this church, we celebrate our differences. We are not a melting pot, but rather a delicious stew. We say, I'm sorry, we have fun, we make mistakes, we forgive. We ask for forgiveness, and we pray for and with each other. This is a loving community, and we welcome you to worship with us. So before we begin this service, I don't know about you, but we've been a little hairy this morning. So let us all take a deep breath. <sighs> Let's do it one more time so that we may all be fully present. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Today's scripture is from the message translation of the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Jesus said to his disciples, There was once a rich man who had been a manager. He got reports that the manager had been taking advantage of his position by running up huge personal expenses. So he called him in and said, What's this I hear about you? You are fired, and I want a complete audit of your books. The manager said to himself, what am I going to do? I've lost my job as manager. I'm not strong enough for a labor job, and I am too proud to beg. Ah, I've got a plan. Here's what I'll do. Then when I'm turned out into the street, people will take me into their houses. Then he went at it. One after another, he called in the people who were in debt to his master. He said to the first, how much do you owe my master? The man replied, 100 jugs of olive oil. The manager said, here, take your bill, sit down here, quick now, write 50. To the next he said, and you, what do you owe? That man answered, 100 sacks of wheat. He said, take your bill, write it in. Now here's the surprise. The manager praised, the master praised the crooked manager. And why? Because he knew how to look after himself. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than law-abiding citizens. They are on constant alert, looking for angles, surviving by their wits. I want you to be smart in the same way, but for what is right. Using every adversity to stimulate you to create a survival, to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials, so that you'll live, really live, and not complacently just get by on good behavior. Jesus went on then to make these comments. If you're honest in small things, you'll be honest in big things. If you're a crook in small things, you'll be a crook in big things. If you're not honest in small jobs, who will put you in charge of the store? No worker can serve two bosses. He'll either hate the first and love the second, or adore the first and despise the second. You can't serve both God and the bank. The word of God for the people of God. God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is not an easy passage to preach. Today we have this strange parable about shady money. And the nagging questions of this text are how do we serve both God and the highest good, and what it takes to procure wealth. But this is all in divine order, because this is the last sermon I will preach as your local pastor, as I move into my role as ACM for vitality, transformation, and sustainability. In my new role, while building relationships with churches is key, not just to build the vitality of the church, but also to find ways to build relationships that can help build and sustain the larger church. And that includes finances. So I felt that today's text, which is a challenging one, speaks to some of the challenges I will face in my new position. So here's the danger of talking about money in the pulpit. <laughs> If the only time we talk about money is when we need more of it to balance the church books, we reinforce the view that the church has nothing to add to the conversation about money. And then we perpetuate the gap between our faith and our everyday lives. But I would venture to say that every single one of us does try to serve both God and wealth in some way or another. I mean, how can we not? Wealth of some sort or another is essential for our very lives, at least in the world I live in. And sometimes we squander those gifts to be sure. At other times, we make it work for us in whatever ways we have to. But what is the balance? I mean, how do we both serve God and nurture covenantal relationships and have the finances we need? And like the manager in this story we just 
just heard, our relationship with wealth is complicated. And on top of that, there is no single biblical view about economics. Why? Because that relationship between wealth is pretty complex. And sound by theology or biblical maxims just don't work. I mean, this is more complex than a name it and claim it theology. Wealth alone is not an indicator of God's blessing. And this is more complex than praying to increase your territory. <coughs> this parable is not a theology of prosperity, but rather a relational theology, which is a theme that runs across all the Gospels. Wealth is both a blessing and a responsibility. We are blessed to be a blessing. And we are held accountable for how we use the resources that we have accumulated. But you know what, when I think about this story, I find it helpful to remember what leads us up to this point. Because in the Gospel, up to this point, Jesus is consistently provoking the growing rage of his peers by freely forgiving the sins of those that, who came to him. In fact, in Matthew 9, it recalls that his critics didn't so much mind the healing as much as they were angered by his daring to forgive sins. I mean, he was just like giving forgiveness away. And in an odd way, this story breaks open a new view of God's impulse to just give stuff away, give grace away, give blessings away, give healings away. And here we have Jesus going way outside the box by bringing up a topic that has to do with shady money, not restricted funds, not philanthropic donations, not arms, not ties, but shady money, you know, funds that are gathered legally but morally questionable. So how does a Christian go about using that money and at the same time pleasing God? That's the question. The short answer? The way you please God is by using even shady money to help lift a foot off the necks of the poor. You want to make friends with God? You want to please God? This scripture tells us one way to do that is through the right use of your wealth. In fact, if we look at this text from the point of view that wealth is a responsibility, it may be that the manager earned his money by charging interest on the amounts his boss sent him to collect. And perhaps the shrewdness of the manager comes through the recognition that he has put amassing his personal wealth ahead of creating, sustaining, and nurturing relationships. And then when he finds himself between a rock and a hard place, he cuts the amount that people owe him by decreasing the money he was previously getting from them. So therefore, he avoids the accusation that is he's cheating his boss, his master, but at the same time, establishing, perhaps even strengthening relationships. I think sometimes maybe we're a little like this manager, trying to live past our bad decisions. My prayer today is that in some small way, each of us will realize that we have each been given a gift when we acknowledge where God has placed our feet. That even in our profiting from working the system, we are still standing in places that put us in relationship to one another. And there are always opportunities to make things right. Some long-standing, general standard operating wrongs. So this story really isn't 
about shady money or corrupt practices. Here, Luke is concerned with our relationship to wealth and how that affects our relationships with others. So while it is a story about one who acted in a dishonest way to enrich himself, he now acts to enrich others and creates new kinds of re relationships that are mutually beneficial. So what are we left with? What, what's the good news? I think it comes down to the same place that most of Jesus' strange stories come to. Relationships. I mean, at the beginning of the story, we have many strained relationships. There is a strained employer-employee relationship. There are debts and there are debtors. But at the end of the story, we are left with a reconciled relationship and canceled debt. And if I may say, I think this whole story is a little outrageous. <laughs> I mean, it makes no sense for the owner to praise someone for canceling the debts that people owe to him. He didn't get what was coming to him, and yet he celebrated. But then I remember Jesus teaching the disciples to pray, give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone indebted to us. Amen. And that's it. That's the point. That's the good news. The kingdom of God isn't about fairness. And this parable blows our mind because it seems to go against all of our common understanding of what is fair. But like I have said before, sometimes being right is irrelevant. It's not about people getting what they deserve or what they are owed. The kingdom of God is about relationships. It's about reconciliation. It's about forgiving our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's about having a little less so others can have just a little more. This is not an easy story to hear. And it's sometimes an even harder story to live. I mean, it doesn't make good economic sense. But then, we serve a God that has a funny way of not making sense at all. I mean, it doesn't make sense to plant a weed in a garden. It doesn't make sense to throw a party for people who can't invite you to theirs. It doesn't make sense to turn the other cheek. It doesn't make sense to leave behind a flock just because one of your sheep has strayed. Or to throw a party for your good for nothing son who finally comes back home with his tail between his legs. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that God would come to earth and take on flesh. It doesn't make sense that Jesus would do all that he did for a people that responded by murdering him. So people of God, most of us profess what we believe that we said we want to follow for the most part doesn't make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense unless you are working to be in this world and not of it. It doesn't make sense unless you value community over competition. Unless you value people over profit. This is a strange parable. It is a challenge. It's a challenge to look at how our relationships with others plays out when money is involved. 
It's a challenge to think about what canceling a debt really looks like. It's a challenge to consider how I endeavor to serve both wealth and God at the same time. So as I close, I ask you to prayerfully consider on behalf of the Illinois Conference. What are the implications of this philosophy for the church? Okay, here's a question. Let's think about all the riches of the church. The ministries, the talents, the assets. What would it take to reconcile the relationships broken by the way we as a church have accrued those gifts? Also consider, what if our way forward as a mainline American church is to give away the very gifts we've been guarding so carefully behind our doors? What would that look like? I just want you to think about that for a moment. So today, in lieu of our corporate prayer time in your bulletin, you each have an envelope with an index card inside. I want you to take that out. And the envelope is dated a month from now, October 18th. 20th, I'm sorry. So I want you to think about the name of one person, one relationship, that you want to improve or deepen and deserves the investment of your wealth. By wealth, I mean your time, your energy, and your resources. Think about what you are willing to give or give up to establish a mutually beneficial relationship. I want you to think about somebody who owes you something it might be just an apology. It might be the repayment of a loan. Maybe they just owe you some time. Whose debt are you willing to cancel this day? Write that name down right now. Oh! 
So with my best, my very best, I set you free. I wish you shelter from the storm, a cozy fire to keep you warm. But most of all, when snowflakes fall. even though God appreciates it. <laughs> so I want to say thank you. Thank you to Josephine and to the council, because I know when I first met with you, I freaked you out. And I know that several of you were, you want to do what, when? Like now? Like our Michelle? our pastor and thank you for daring to work through a process with me to be able to be in dialogue to speak your truth and say whoa take it easy justo slow down baby 
We need to think about this. We need to process this. We need to reflect upon this. And we'll get back to you. And when Josephine became ill and needed to take care of herself, Debbie came right to the plate and we were able to negotiate what I believe all churches and all people should negotiate, always a win-win scenario so that we honor the dignity of those that we engage and we honor our needs instead of doing the American thing, I win, so you must have to lose. So on behalf of the Illinois Conference, I certainly want to just pause and really say thank you. Thank you for your willingness to trust God. Thank you for sharing Michelle with the conference. I know and you know and she knows that her heart will be here and that she'll do anything that she can do to continue to support you in her new role. And I also know that Pastor Gloria has got this and will lead and be in dialogue and will be God's shepherd until you discern you don't select. God's already done that. Until you discern who is next to journey with you at this phase. When I left my congregation in Buffalo, I knew that my call at that point was to pass the baton, not knowing to who it would be passed, but trusting that God's got this. So I left them a letter. And two years later, the new pastor called me and said thank you. Because I knew what they knew, that they were taking over a mighty and powerful community of faith. Gloria, Pastor Gloria, you are taking over a mighty and powerful community of faith. And you will lead, and then you will pass the baton. And God will continue to be God, and God will continue to be glorified. Amen. Amen. As we move to the service of release, our church family is consistently changing. Some of us deny change and hate it, but the reality is that we are all changing. I know that I can testify that my body has become a one-person orchestra with all the noises that it seems to make at this stage of my life. People come and people go. Babies are born and we celebrate them. Children grow up. People commit themselves to one another. Loved ones and friends among us come to the end of their lives and we remember and we continue to remember. Individuals move into our community and you've got a lot of opportunity that's coming before you even in the midst of gentrification for new people to come into your community and into the church. Others leave moving away to new places, new experiences, and in the case of Pastor Michelle, new opportunities that God knew before I was able to discern it. It is important and right that we recognize these kinds of passages of endings and beginnings. Today we share the time of farewell with our sister, our pastor, our friend and colleague, Michelle, as she is leaving to take on the new challenge of helping to bring life and vitality to the Illinois Conference. Josephine and Bob. Good morning. Thank you, Michelle, for asking me to speak today on this Sunday as we release you and celebrate our time together. Many of you know.
know I'm a reluctant public speaker, but when Michelle asked, I couldn't tell her no. She already knows I've loved her from the get-go. And it has been a pleasure to reflect back on our time together. God sent us Pastor Michelle in May of 2018. In her first letter in the tidings, she wrote, she acknowledged our loss of Pastor Eiberg and the good work we had done together as a congregation. She wrote, God placed us in this place and time together for the sacred task of preparing for the future of this congregation. I pray we all become fast friends. I found it easy to become fast friends with Michelle because she is loving, friendly, vulnerable, funny, kind, trustworthy, and forgiving. I heard this quote and I thought about you, Michelle. Everyone either nourishes you or depletes you. I feel she has nourished all of us. Here's an example of what I mean. Not long after Michelle arrived, we shared sacred moments with the family, saying goodbye to their beloved at Loyola Hospital. As we left, she hugged me and said, thank you for being your best self. I feel that Michelle has seen and encouraged the best in all of us. We have done so much work in these 14 months you've been with us. In September of 2018, you held a retreat for council. In October, you held small group meetings helping us explore our experiences being a member of Pilgrim and then composing statements about our past and future longings. We had wonderful holiday celebrations. In February, for Black History Month, our own members shared their history. In March, for Women's History Month, we paid tribute to three of our elder women by having three of our youth interview them and then present their stories. During Lent, each Wednesday, we held a 30-minute prayer service and an intergenerational gathering. On March 16th, Pilgrim and Gather hosted an interfaith ecumenical prayer workshop. Michelle attended most deacon meetings. Early on, she had great ideas for us to implement. The welcome table is a great example. A simple, recognizable process by which visitors are able to express an interest in knowing more about Pilgrim and how to join, which by October 18th had resulted in seven new members. Since then, five more people have joined us. She found Pastor Tim, and what a blessing he and Gather are to us. From leading adult ed, to preaching, and of course, his fabulous Thursday evening Bible study. Michelle encouraged our creativity by changing our Sunday service. This summer, some summer we experimented with contemplative and storytelling services. She continually encouraged us to become involved in the wider church. Five pilgrims attended the spring CMA meeting. A number of pilgrims attended, attended the general synod. Wilbert conducted the choir for the fall CMA meeting and many pilgrims sang. In March of this year, we began receiving nominations for the search committee. By May, they were commissioned. In June, small group meetings were held for the congregation to discuss their vision for the future. They're meeting almost every week, and as we just heard, profiles have been received, and interviews are beginning, and they hope to be done by October 8th. The search committee has been on fire. Michelle, you are so gifted, from preaching to a majority-wide congregation in a way that we can open our hearts and minds. To understand the racial divide in our country, to officiating a memorial service, 
to preparing contemplative services, to dancing the wall at the food truck rest. <laughs> <laughs> what fun we've had with you while doing the hard work of transitioning. Michelle was a great comfort to me when my sister Linda died unexpectedly in January. I remember her telling me to be gentle with herself. I didn't quite understand at first, but as time went on and I had no energy for anything, I could hear her say, just be gentle with yourself. We have shared many laughs. Easter Sunday, when you said you thought we might have to disrobe me before service could begin. That's the inside joke. <laughs> to the Sunday morning when I happened by your office and you didn't have your sermon on your laptop. I am so excited for you in your new role as Associate Conference Minister of Vitality Transformation. Sustainability. And sustainability. <laughs> Reverend Gonzalez, you certainly got the right one to bring the Illinois Conference into the future. 1 Corinthians 13 says from the message translation, if I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day. And that if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. Michelle does that. She speaks with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy. She has strong faith and speak God, speaks God's word with power. And she loves. You have loved and shepherded us in preparing for the future of this congregation. With your loving support and guidance, we are ready, with the help of God, our faithful associate, Pastor Gloria, to go forward. I love you. I will miss you greatly. Thank you for all you've done for Pilgrim during this amazing interim period. can still hear me. So I'm going to go back to uh, the search committee. And we interviewed a few people. And then we interviewed Michelle. And one thing that I remember distinctly her saying that we should reimagine how we do worship and how we have church. And I didn't know what that meant. I knew the word, but how do you reimagine church and worship? And there were many other things that we were impressed by with her, obviously, since we ended up saying we want her. And then we heard from other people, we had this reception, I mean, this is the going away reception today, but we had the welcoming reception, and we heard from many of the, our guests who said, you got to be happy with her. She's a gem. And of course, we didn't have the experience with her at that point. But today, I can say, they were so right. We are so happy and so blessed and so much better off for having brought Michelle into our congregation. She's an excellent administrator. 
And that sounds sort of blasé, but if you know, if you don't know her role, it goes beyond preaching. So we came at her with things like, well, Michelle, we got this problem. How do we, do, how do we fix this? And then the challenge would be thrown back to us with a question of, well, do you have a policy? Well, no, we don't have a policy. So I would say within the last year and a little over a year and a half, we have developed several policies that have gotten us in a better place as we move forward. And thanks to Michelle, we now have these roadmaps on how we can solve problems and how we can better manage our programming. So that was real important from, uh, I hope the congregation can see the uh, positive effects of our work in that area. So then I thought, in speaking to you today, I can't not speak about Michelle as my friend. Because we've had a lot of laughs. Uh, our one-on-one -on -one meetings often ended up in storytelling and laughter. And Bobby had mentioned the food truck rally, or well, what I remember from the food truck rally is her line dancing. I was like, wow, she can even do that. <laughs> and we have it on video, too. <laughs> so she's not only a really good friend to me, but Michelle came into our church community and then made friends outside of the church community within our great community. So you mentioned bringing Tim to us and the soloist today, and hit two or three restaurants in the area, and she has made friends with their, the owners or managers, and therefore they got to know Pilgrim. So you're here to have dinner with Pastor Michelle. Yeah. And then that's the door open for us to say, yeah, you know, we're at Pilgrim. So all of that matters. And we really appreciate that outreach into the greater community. And then as a pastor, and Bobby spoke to this, it wasn't long after Michelle arrived that we found out that her training and her experience and her compassion just kicked right in, didn't skip a beat. She just picked it up and embraced us and got us through those moments of sorrow. And one in particular, the, the Loyola visit, one of our precious members, and we all fell apart. And Michelle lifted us all up and got us through that. There were times when I'll say hi, Michelle. And then there are other times when I'll say, hi, Pastor. And she'll say, so you like the sermon today, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll say this, she can preach. If there was ever a doubt or a question when she showed up as to whether she could preach, she let us know that right away. So I'm going back now to that reimagined statement that stayed with me after our interview. Many of the things that we've seen, that we've talked about already today, are ways of reimagining how we do policy, how we carry out the programming of the church. And then as a preacher, she can make you cry. She can make you laugh. She may break out in a song from Janis Joplin, like me and Bobby McGee. And you're like, well, how do we get there? But it, you know, it all fits, and then it makes you laugh, and it makes you see the, the message in the context of the real world, because it's all so relatable. And, and that's the preacher in her. So when I walk out the door and she's standing there, I'll say, that was good, Pastor. And then we go and we have a meeting, and then she's my friend. So we wear these different hats, and I have so enjoyed wearing both of those hats with her. 
So we did reimagine the church. We reimagined worship service as she led us through it. And we embraced it. That's what's so important. She took us down this winding road, it seems. I tried this. Think about this. And we were willing to try these things. And we embraced that kind of leadership. And again, we are better for it. So we've been blessed to have Michelle. We're going to miss her, but she's still in our church community. So to my personal friend and my pastor, I say to the conference leaders, we express our gratitude for your time among us. We express our gratitude for your time among us. We ask your forgiveness for our mistakes. We ask your forgiveness for our mistakes. Your influence on our faith and faithfulness. Your influence on our faith and faithfulness. Will not leave us at your departure. Will not leave us at your departure. I forgive you and accept your gratitude trusting that our time together and our parting are pleasing to God. Will all who are able please rise at this time? Do you members and friends of Pilgrim United Church of Christ release Reverend Michelle Hughes from the duties of interim ministry here. If so, say, we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. Do you offer your encouragement for her ministry soon to begin as Associate Conference Minister of the Illinois Conference? If so, say, we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. Do you, you may be seated. Do you, Reverend Michelle Hughes, release this local church from turning to you and depending on you? I do with the help of God. Do you offer your encouragement for the continued ministry here and on the relationship with another who will come to serve, I do with the help of God. On behalf of the Illinois Conference of the United Church of Christ, I witness the words spoken, the words of thankfulness, forgiveness, and release. The member churches of the Chicago Metropolitan Association and the Illinois Conference hold each of you in prayer. We pledge our support in the transition signified in this service. Repeat with me. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for remembered time when we together have shared the life of faith. We thank you for the moments we have shared with Pastor Michelle in worship, in learning, in service, in celebration, in laughter, in joy, and in sadness. We pray that Pastor Michelle will be aware of your spirit's guidance as she moves to the Illinois Conference. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and God's people say, Amen. We go now surrounded by our love and by the promise of God, the presence of Jesus Christ, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good
morning. Um, Michelle made a request of me about a month ago when we knew this was going to be the day of her farewell celebration, if I could please um, write a song for her for today's celebration. So um, with God's help, here it is. It's called uh, May God Bless You and Keep You. Go in peace.